Welcome to the Finding the Magic podcast, where books come alive. I'm Tricia Copeland, a fiction author and host of this show. If you love books, finding great reads, and hearing about the story behind the story directly from the authors, this is the place for you. Whether you like fantasy, science fiction, dystopian, or romance titles, I think you'll find something to love in my playlist. Listen in to discover something magical about a book or two today. Welcome, Alan. I am very glad to be here. Hello, Tricia. Hello. So we have T. Alan Horn. He is an author of two books. One I know is Secret Sky, that is a middle grade fantasy, correct? That is correct. It kind of hit hinges or hints on sci-fi themes as well, I think. Yeah, right? I call it a science fantasy, but you, you can certainly categorize it as fantasy. Okay. And you have another book that's already out, right? Called Yes. Advent My Nine. first book came out in 2022. Advent Nine. Uh, it's available everywhere. Okay. But, uh, and is that a middle grade too? Uh, no, that is a young adult. It does uh, contain uh, subject matter that is more appropriate for mid to late teens and after that. I don't expect a lot of people to graduate from Secret Sky directly into Advent 9. Okay. Yeah, and it looks like Advent 9 might be the first of a series. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Um, and... I'm hoping to get the second book of that series done as soon as I wrap up the second book of Secret Sky. Oh, that's fun. So you're going to have a lot of books coming out. And yes, it is my hope time. to publish at least one book a year for the rest of my life. That is my <laughs> life goal. Very cool. That sounds a lot of fun. Well, we're going to rewind and dig down deeper into both Secret Sky and Advent 9. Which one do you want to talk about first? Um. Well, maybe we should handle them chronologically. Let's start with Advent 9 because that was how my, public, my uh, author journey started. So it may be a better place to start. That sounds fun. You want to jump in and just tell us about the characters, the story, and maybe how yeah. you got published. Advent 9 is a story about a world where superheroes have gone extinct. And the last superhero on Earth, who has no memory of how he started hero work or why he's the last one left, tries to prevent the apocalypse while solving the many mysteries that, you know, surround his life. And the only hint he has for that is a recurring nightmare in which a disembodied voice compels him to count to nine. And so uh, I wanted to create a really interesting superhero story. And um, one thing that happens during the course of the story is that Advent Nine meets up with an old supervillain who is also a medical doctor. And the supervillain who feels indebted to Advent Nine because he saved the supervillain's life, eventually confides to him, you know, I've I've done research, I've been examining you, and I'm pretty sure you have autism. And so Advent Nine has to deal with an autism diagnosis as he solves all these other mysteries in connection with his life. And I wanted to do that because of all the parallels that I saw between autistic people and superheroes, the uh, introversion, the brooding, the secret keeping, the codes of honor they live by. There were all these parallels which were already there, but just weren't being addressed by people. And so I decided to address them. Interesting. And, yeah. So do we, is it, can you tell us what the theme of nine is and is that, is that going to be important? In the well, book? it's a spoiler. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so nine is an important number to add a nine. It's a number that practically rules his life, although not always in obvious ways. It's, it's kind of, you know, psycho, it's kind of like a psychological, supernatural, almost connection he has to the number nine. And, um, the guy who edited this book, David Farland, who is a best-selling author himself of the Rune Lords, he read the book and he said, this is the first time I've seen a superhero story done right as a prose novel. Oh, and he has seen a lot of superhero stories because he was also the chief judge for Writers of the Future. And um, he, he edited the book, gave me a free second pass because he liked the book so much. And agreed to help me publish it, but halfway through the process, he kicked the bucket. So, so I, so the launch of Advent Nine was a bit rocky. It like um, like most authors, I have it. I have a what you could call a test novel, the first one, 
where you basically learn the ropes. And so Advent Nine was my test novel. And uh, now I'm trying to dive back in with Secret Sky and I am a lot more prepared with the second book. I learned so many things from trying to promote and sell the first book. And now I am, I am doing a whole lot more for this new installment. Well, was, did you self-publish Advent Nine or was that? Yes, yes, okay. I self-published Advent Nine. Um, couldn't get a publisher for it, even with David Farland's help. And he advocated for me really seriously. And just traditional publishing is just not in a good way right now. And there's so much, you know, I hardly need to bring it up here because you can just look it up anywhere. People are talking about it all over the place. Traditional publishing, you know, it's always on the rocks, but but it's in a very big period of flux right now. And I don't I don't think anybody quite knows what is going to happen next. Interesting. Hadn't heard that, but I will do my research. <laughs> it's like, because I think Secret Sky, you are having it published by... No, it is also yeah. self-published. Oh, it's self-published too, sorry. Yeah, Trisolation Media is my company, but okay. uh, like, like, you know, you wouldn't know it's a self-published book just by looking at the cover. And part well, of that... I think all of us, like, try for that goal, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's a I, I, So this I, is Secret I, Sky. This is a hardcover mm -hmm. version. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a beautiful book. It, yeah. And I did start I started listening on YouTube. I haven't gotten all the way through the YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first 12 chapters of Secret Sky are available for free listening on YouTube as an enhanced audiobook experience. And I highly recommend those 12 videos. And also there's an omnibus video with all 12 in one. Um, oh, that's good to know. So yeah, I tried to create different videos that appeal to different viewing styles. And the videos, they were a lot of hard work, but people who watch them have enjoyed them and it's really helped them get into the book. So if you are at all on the fence about Secret Sky, I recommend just doing the free YouTube videos because, you know, anyone can do them. It costs you nothing. Yeah, I really liked the book. I didn't watch the video. I was listening, mm -hmm. um, but the voices are great. The, the cine, well, oh, I, I say cinematography, but the yeah. sounds and the music. Yeah, the and soundscape. It, the soundscape. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, we 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 had got an excellent audiobook narrator named Andrew Iden, and what I didn't know when I hired him is that he's actually a pretty big name in the romance space. He does a few middle grade novels, but he's mostly known for romance. And so my sister in law calls me up and she says, "I didn't know you got Andrew Iden to do your book. He's my favorite audiobook narrator." And it's like, oh wow, I I didn't know that. Well, talk to me about Agent. We're going to jump back to Agent Nine real quick, and then we'll yeah. start about Secret Sky. So, why why write a superhero? Um, like I said, I saw parallels between superheroes and autistic people, okay. and I wanted to explore that because it it was right there. It's always there. It's just nobody was really talking about it. So, I wanted to do an do a uh, a novel where a superhero discovers that not all of his antisocial behaviors are because he is a superhero mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, where he has to team up with a previous supervillain. Like I said, the supervillain is a medical doctor and this medical doctor who just thought that his nemesis was rude all these years <laughs> comes to realize, oh, there's actually something there. And so as they start to work together, he starts to having to come clean to Advent 9 about what he thinks is going on. And it's something that Advent 9 now has to deal with alongside the fact that he's trying to prevent the apocalypse. Well, and trying to get his memories back. And uh -huh. does he even remember why this guy is a nemesis? Does he remember mm -hmm. saving his life? Yeah. There's so much to uncover there. <laughs> yeah, there is a lot to uncover. And um, it, it's, uh, it is a bit more mature than Secret Sky. So like I said, probably readers of Secret Sky, most readers of Secret Sky are not going to immediately graduate into Advent 9. Uh, it, it, it has, you know, language and violence and implied off-screen relations that probably aren't for the same audience. But um, everyone who reads it says that the ending caught them by surprise and that they weren't it went in ways they weren't expecting and that it was extremely original and they and i've heard had many great compliments about advent nine and i'm very proud of it 
I'm really looking forward to come back to the series, but right now I'm working on my middle grade series and that is my priority at the moment. Fun. Yeah. So, and you said um, the main character, you said Advent Nun was young adult as the main character. How old? Yeah. Yeah, the main, the main character is a 16-year-old boy. Okay, but he's a superhero, but yes. he doesn't remember why. Okay, wow, that's a, that's a lot going on there for a 16-year-old, mm -hmm. too. Yes. And is it set in present-day contemporary? It's or? it's near future, so yeah. like maybe an alternate future that's five to ten years ahead of us. Okay, so maybe a little bit technology upgrades, but about what we experience. Okay. Yeah, uh, another side plot point that happens in the book is that people abandon uh, the previous communications networks of fiber optics and satellites because they've invent invented a way to make uh, quantum entanglement work for communications. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, That's it, okay. I know what quantum computing is. That's as far as yeah. I can get. So. Well, it, it, it's, it's not a central plot point. It's something that happens over the course of the book. Right. Okay. Well, fun. Yeah, and it sounds like a little bit urban fantasy-y. Um, yeah, it's continuing. definitely urban. And I mean, fantasy in the sense that a lot of the science is mostly hand wave -um. You know, it's superheroes. <laughs> well, superheroes don't superheroes. exactly yeah. follow science to a T. No. <laughs> I think um, Iron Man tried, but I'm not sure how close he got. So. Yeah. Well, fun. Um, yeah, so I did start listening to Secret Sky, and that's interesting that you have in Advent 9 the theme of the dreams, because mm -hmm. in Secret Sky, you also have that dream theme. Yeah, it's a common trope in speculative fiction, science oh. fiction, and fantasy. Um, that That is probably the strongest tie between the two books. I mean, they definitely don't take place in the same universe or continuity, but they, in as much as they are speculative fiction, you know, dreams are going to be important in both. Okay. Okay, we'll dive in and tell us about Secret Sky and Skylar, the main character. Yeah. Secret Sky, the young universe, I really wanted to do just i really just wanted to create an amazing fantasy adventure and i wanted to i wanted to create something that um that you know that could explore big ideas big philosophical ideas and insights but through the lens of an adventure and the characters don't always necessarily know that uh the adventure they're on has you know deeper philosophical meaning they're just having fun but in the background there are all these you know insights about the universe and where humanity comes from and what kind of people what what kind of people humans are and our place in the universe and um though the story is just about a boy who loses his family and tries to survive in the aftermath there are you know i there are themes i was able to explore themes in this book really deeply and I'm really hoping that a lot of people will be able to appreciate that, even people outside the middle grade market, because there are, you know, subtext. The subtext, I think, will appeal a great deal to adults, while the ch childish fantasy adventure will appeal greatly to kids. Yeah, I love the beginning of just in how it feels. Well, listening to it felt very magical. Of mm -hmm. um, You're describing how the main character, Skylar, is seen by other people in the village and you know he's so excited about i think it's a, it's not a horse but it, he's getting no. a new baby animal mm -hmm. um, from his father and it's the first time he's going to have this responsibility and um mm -hmm. yeah i can my kids are a little bit older now but i used to read to them a lot and i can imagine that would be something that i, I would have loved reading to them yeah and i love to start simple because i think fantasy and science fiction work better when you start simple I, I've known too many science fiction books, especially that start with like a 200 year history of the galactic empire. And then it just throws you into politics and stuff. And I, I, I think all books should start simple. And I, with Secret Sky, I got the opportunity to start real simple with just a boy living in a basically medieval village. And he is just so happy that he is going to be responsible for this new calf that's being born. Yeah, and I mean, it starts a little bit off of, you know, this is the 
this is the oldest story in time to get yeah. stuff. Well, the narrate I had to introduce the narrator first because it is an omniscient narrator and a narrator who has a name and a personality. And so chapter one, which is only a few pages long, is just the narrator introducing himself. And he is allowed to be a bit cryptic and mystical, but mostly he's also just simply trying to tell you a story. And it's it's going to get weird and complicated. But right now he's just, I'm going to tell you a story. And, and um, uh, <laughs> the thing about my books is that even though I try to start simple, it never stays that way. <laughs> they always get really layered and complicated and full of many different character arcs and plot points at the end. But I always keep it simple at the beginning to make it easier to digest. And well, so yeah, by if you have too much coming at you at one time, yeah. it's, it's hard to keep yeah. up. So by the end of the book, Skylar is going to be in a much different place than when he begins. He's going to be handling, you know, the affairs of an entire kingdom. He's going to be trapped in a conflict between knights and kings and lords. And he's going to be, you know, trying to hide the secret of where he came from. Because if anybody finds out he came from this one village, he will be put to death. <clears throat> and so... The, the biggest theme of the book is, you know, the burden of keeping secrets. You know, secrets can give you power. Having secrets can give you power over others, but they can also make life harder in amazing ways. And okay. so Secret Sky explores the idea of what keeping secrets does to a person. Interesting. And why did you choose to write it as a middle grade book? <clears throat> well... I came to the conclusion that I needed a, a narrator, an omniscient narrator, a name narrator who was familiar with the modern day world um, so that he could explain some of the weird philosophical things going on behind the background, because no way is Skylar going to be able to recognize and explain those in narrative. So I knew I needed an omniscient narrator and I knew I wanted a book that could be read by young people as well as old. And those things kind of come together in middle grade in a big way. And I wanted to make the story, you know, inspiring and something that that wouldn't lock people out due to content ages. So middle grade is pretty much the sweet spot for that. And middle grade, I think, you know, it allows people to uh, appreciate a fun fantasy adventure yet also have, you know, deeper you know, philosophical underpinnings. And I, think, do you, I mean, that sounds like, especially the theme of secrets and keeping secrets is perfect for that age because I think they're just, I mean, becoming aware of more society as a whole and how mm -hmm. they work in society and how their family works in society and how society is, our society is built. And so, yeah. and yeah, and those things that, you know, maybe have, you know, issues with other people or uh, other authorities or, you know, um, just kind of exploring what it means to share who you are and what you are and how appropriate those things are sometimes. Yeah. And Yeah, in middle grade, the middle grade age is where kids start to get a grasp of how the world actually works, including, you know, the dark, gritty underbelly of everything. And um, so, yeah, the idea of keeping secrets becomes more important as we get older because kids can't keep secrets. Young kids can't. They just they just can't. So like at the beginning of the story in the chapter where Skylar is introduced, it talks specifically about how, how the this the approaching birth of this new calf is a secret that Skylar simply can't keep. He can't keep it to himself because he's a kid and he doesn't know how to keep secrets. And so he's blurting it out to everyone he can find. And by the end of the first book, he has secrets that could kill him. And so he has to learn how to hold his tongue and how to fake it until you break it. And he he just, as things get more and more dangerous, he has to learn how to prevent more and more of a front. And it's, that is a very, you know, that is a coming of age event, you know, learning how to present your public mask, which is something that everybody does. Yeah, that's that's a huge learning curve for it. I think he's is he supposed to be about ten. Yes, yeah. he is ten in the books. Um, he uh, 
he is 10 and uh over the course of the books he will age up a bit but uh for the most part this this series remains middle grade from start to finish okay and you said you're writing the second book in the series where is that going to take him well at the end of the first book he finds himself forcibly indentured into best friendship with the king the same king that ordered the destruction of his village that, that king needs a best friend he says i need to pick one from among the children of the noble families and skylar is pretending to be the child of one of the king's knights and he's like well he's perfect i choose i order that boy to be my best friend and, and so how the old is the, sorry how old is the king is the king he's 10 adult? the he king is 10, 10 years old too. okay okay so two 10-year-old boys now, and at the beginning of the second book, sees Skylar trying to fulfill his duties as the king's best friend, knowing that this particular king is responsible for the death of all his loved ones, and how he has to hold constantly hold his tongue and pretend to be friendly with this person who he would never willingly associate with. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. Um, so it's interesting that... I mean, was someone advising this king to do this or these warring people? Yeah. Well, in chapter three, um, in chapter three, it makes clear that uh, that the destruction of Skylar's village was the uh, dying request of the previous king, who, you know, is the current king's father. And a lot of mystery is built up as to why the old king would want this one particular no-name village out in the middle of nowhere to be destroyed. And that's a mystery that's going to be addressed as the series unfolds. Okay. Well, lots of intrigue there. That sounds like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And then you said you're going to continue the Advent 9 series as well. So you have a lot to do. Yes. Yes. I need to, I really need to get on top of writing these books um, it's just, it's so hard to write and promote at the same time because they take a lot of work. Like each of those videos I made for the uh, audiobook presentation, each video took me like two days to make. Oh, I can imagine. I was listening. I was like, this is an amazing production. Yeah. Video editing is tedious work. I mean, it's, it's very engrossing work. I can lose an entire day just video editing and not realize where the time has gone. But um, yeah, it's also work that takes me away from writing. So like I, I reach 12 chapters and I'm like, okay, this is a good place to stop. This gives people a very generous sample of the book. And then I can just go back to doing the writing work. Of course, uh, I also, as part of my promotion, decided to create like 64 clip videos, which are derived from the chapter videos where I just take snippets out and then post those as individual videos. And I'm going to release those, like three of those a day over the next 20 days or so. And a whole, because, because when you release a lot of videos over regularly over a period of days, it really pleases the YouTube algorithm. Oh, and and so if, if people watch even one of the clip videos, YouTube is going to recommend more clip videos to them. And if they watch more clip videos, then YouTube is going to recommend the chapter videos to them. And if they watch all the 12 chapter videos, then hopefully I can get them to read the whole book. I would bet if they're that committed, I think you pretty much have them. So that's yeah. good. Tell me about your background. Are you a literate? Were you in literature before or in English or in writing? Journalism? Oh, no, I am. Um, my major was in computer science. Okay. I always knew I wanted to be an author, but um, it was obvious also that I would need a day job. So I went into computer science, learned as much as I learned as much as I could about computer science. And while I was working a job as a software engineer, I was also investing my money because I know that publishing, whether self-publishing or traditional, it still requires a lot of money. And so I, uh, you know, learned as much as I could about investing and built up <clears throat> a cushion to the point where, where I would be able to support myself writing. And eventually I was able to quit my day job because of that cushion expanded so well. And now I am just full-time an author. That's <clears throat> great. Yeah. 
Um, I started writing in high school. I won a local writing contest, a short story contest, and that pretty much uh, bolstered my confidence that I could actually write books. Uh, tried my hand writing before college. It was all terrible. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, eventually gotten to found my groove. Um, I was... I was finally able to understand what makes great story structure and how to write sentences that would make people want to read the next one. I went to a lot of writers conferences, like uh, like dozens of writers conferences, and I learned at the feet of people who knew what they were doing, professionals in the industry. And I think that um, as far as advice to young writers go, I would say go to whatever writers conferences you can, because there is some great stuff there. Like th I, I don't get the same thing out of writers conferences anymore because I already know so much of this stuff. But for someone who is just starting out, there is nothing that is more beneficial than just going to people who do this for a living and learning from them. Yeah, I talked to a um, young writer. She's she was 14 when I interviewed her, and I really didn't realize she was that young. Um, but she wrote her first novel when she was 12, 13, and she got in this granting program, and I can't remember the name of that, but it was some big author that granted like so many slots a year to be in this writing course with her. And it was it was very cool. So yeah, I think there's a lot of resources out for all ages of people yeah. that want to write. That's very cool. And um, if you have money, then you can <clears throat> you can make things easier by, by hiring a really good editor like I did with David Farland, although you can't hire him anymore, sadly. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you, uh, if you have, if you have the time and the money, which I realize not everybody does, but you should be going to, you should be going to every author event you can get your hands on just to talk to people in the industry and build those connections and just build your, your basic knowledge of, you know, this art form. It's an art. You've got to study it. You know, just like any other profession, you've got to, you've got to put in the time and learn the craft yeah, really like deciding what people want to read and how people want to read it is a big part of writing, right? Yeah. So this is my favorite question to ask all authors and you can answer it for Secret Sky or Advent 9 and maybe they're mm -hmm. the same answer. But what do you want readers to take away from reading your book? If there's one overarching theme or idea mm -hmm. or just experience, what is it that you feel like you want them to take away from reading your books? Well, with the book, first book, Advent 9, the thing I want people to take away is I want them to realize, oh, autistic people are just like me. And I, I think that um, as beneficial as it is to see you know, autistic people in roles and re representation there. I didn't write Advent 9 to be a representation book. I wrote it to be a book written to people who are not autistic, who can see an autistic person going through their struggles and learn sympathy that way. So with the first book, I definitely wanted to people to go away with an appreciation of <clears throat> the lives autistic people lives despite the fact that it's also an incredibly powerful adventure with you know, like mutants and fights and things like that. So <clears throat> that is what I would like people to take away from that first book. From the second book, I would like them to take away the idea the world they live in is magical and that secrets for as burdensome as they can be are also a kind of magic. And so any world that has secrets and ours certainly does is therefore a magical world. I love that idea. You're the perfect person to come on the Finding the Magic podcast. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being here, Alan. Well, your, I appreciate it. Yeah, your secret sky comes out August 21st. Correct? August 21st, but the first 12 chapters are available right now for anyone who wants to listen to them for free. 
Yes, and it's Secret Sky by T. Allen Horn is your author name. Um, for yes. Advent, I think believe that's the same author name you use. For yes, Advent. it is. And do you have your own website that people can go to? Yes, go to tallenhorn.com. That's T. Allen Horn is one solid word. Okay. And right now it is themed around Secret Sky. You're going to see lots of amazing things related to the book there. You're also going, if you go to my blog, which is on the website, you are going to see a lot of great writing advice and ideas about, you know, how to sell and market books. And you may even find a few treasures there. Oh, fun. I will check it out too then. Okay. <laughs> and follow along. Well, thank you again for being here, Alan. And thank you for inviting me. Success. Bye. Okay. Best of luck. You too. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Finding the Magic podcast. I'm your host, author and podcaster Trisha Copeland, and I love getting behind the scenes. If you like the podcast, make sure to subscribe and stop in each week, to discover new authors and books. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep finding the magic.